Good morning. Lots of conversation this morning. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. We are blessed to gather here this morning on this cool but very sunny Sunday morning. Peace to all of you as we praise and worship God in harmony together this morning. You are so welcome to be here. We just have a couple announcements in the bulletin today. Actually, the same day, same time, on Wednesday at 7 p.m., the session will meet and the choir will sing. And again, along with Nicole, I invite anyone to come, participate, and make a joyful noise as a member of the choir. There is an empty chair for you. Um, you are reminded to bring your Plum Food Pantry Coat donation back next Sunday, October 16th. And I noticed that all the tags are taken. So thank you for everyone for your generous love to help others. And on Tuesday, volunteering is available at the Pittsburgh Mills Food Mission from 4.30 to 6. And I believe you see Jane if you want to help. Um, and from our newsletter, I was made aware that we have four birthdays this week within the congregation. Marion, Chris S., Chris G., and Emma are all celebrating this week. So be sure to extend your happy birthday blessings and wishes to them. Are there any other announcements to be shared in the life of the church? If not, um, I believe Heidi has the minute for mission this morning. Okay, if you came through the front door, you saw the shoe boxes in the narthex. It's Operation Christmas Child for Samaritan Purse. Collection week is the third week of November, so you have lots and lots of times to put your goodies together. If you're not a shopper, there's always money being taken for shipping. Um, I put labels on the Narthex table and some information. You can track your boxes if you want to do a box. You can donate money. You can uh, write a check and put it in the offering plate. If you would write it to Samaritan's Purse in your note, Operation Christmas Child, uh, it'll get sent directly to them. You could send cash, we collect it, and then um, Linda will write it one big check at the end, right before I take it to the collection center. So let me give you a little heads up. We did not do it last year, as we all know. The year before, we collected 46 boxes, $418 we collected for shipping. So you guys always, always are so generous. Two Bible passages I want to read to you. One from Jeremiah, 1-5. Old Testament, mind you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. And out of the New Testament, he said to them, go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. Now, why I read these to you is... Operation Christmas Child isn't just about handing a kid a box of toys or pencils and stuff like that. It's a gift of love that's followed with missions. Um, there's mission, missionaries that are taught to not just hand the box out, but get them to come back and take classes. There's a program of 12 classes that the kids can take. Parents are all also invited where they learn about Christ. And what they found is these kids who take these 12 classes, they get a little certificate, and then they go out and they tell the other villages or whoever they run into, and more and more people are learning about Christ. So the money that we collect, it sounds exorbitant sometimes, but you have to remember, there are so many people who have given up everything to go into a, a country or another part of the world where they know no one to talk about Christ. 
and our mission as Christians is to help. So your generosity is always greatly appreciated. Next week, I hope to have like a little video. But again, as you leave today, feel free to take as many boxes as you, as you want. Uh, the flyers, ask any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Oh, right. We have something even more exciting. Uh, there is, uh, during, just after Collection Week in Baltimore, you can volunteer to pack the boxes. Now, when I say pack the boxes, we send our shoe boxes to a collection place. They truck them down to Baltimore. And then what happens is they get unpacked, looked at, because there's a lot of do's and don'ts for in the boxes. They add books and flyers, and then they pack them into bigger boxes. And we just happen to have a volunteer who was there and can tell us a little bit about what she did. And if anybody's interested, I am more than willing to carpool down, do a four-hour shift, and carpool back again. Um, again, let me know. Like Heidi said, it, it's, it's a, a ton of fun. I went down to Baltimore in 2019 to work at the distribution center. A friend and I drove down that morning. We worked the 1 to 5 o'clock shift and drove back that night. Sure, it was a long day, but it was a priceless day as well. Um, it's a lot of fun. You are assigned to a station with six or seven people, and you look at each box open it up and make sure there's everything in there is permitted to go. And if for some reason the box looks kind of skimpy and you kind of would like more things in it, you ring this little bell and these elves appear with a wagon and, and they bring things in there. You can pick as many items as you want out of the wagon to make your box really generous. And then um, the really nice thing is Every so often, there's another alarm of some sort, I can't remember. And at that time, the box that you are holding, you are to pray over that box. So it's a real spiritual time. We got to meet some other people, and it was a lot of fun. And I already made a reservation to go down in December on a Wednesday. I can talk to you about that, but I, I reserved a few spots because they fill up real quick, so you have to jump on it, and it's easier to contact them and say, no, we don't have three people coming. You know, we have one or two. But you, it's too hard to add them. So if you're interested, like Heidi said, it would be fun if we gathered a day and went down and did the boxes. So anyway, and she's going to tell us more about it in the weeks to come. Let us come into God's presence, breathe, and relax as we personally prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Glorious is your name in all the earth. We celebrate who you are and all that you have done for us. 
You hold our lives in your hands and catch us when we stumble. So we come together today, led by your Holy Spirit to worship you, to sing your praise, to confess our mistakes, and to receive your love and mercy made possible through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Be present among us as we worship you and as we open ourselves to your word. Amen. Will you join with me in the call to worship? Come and praise God. In the company of God's people, let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. Our God is gracious and compassionate. God is and Our God is faithful and trustworthy. Our God is just and good. So come, let's worship God together. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins together. O oh God, so often we take you for granted. We take for granted that you will answer our prayers, that you will heal us and make us whole. We take for granted that you love us. Forgive us for not appreciating your grace and presence in our lives. Help us to be more thankful. Give faith space to see you in everything and everyone around us, so that we may be truly grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the waters of baptism, we have died with Christ, and we have been raised with him to new life. Nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God, of Jesus Christ our Lord. In Christ, we are forgiven and set free to live in peace and thanksgiving. Thanks be to God. Amen. Any children that would like to come up?
so happy that you're both here. We're going to talk today about giving thanks. What happens in your life that you feel thankful for? Anything? Jesus being in your life? How about if um, someone um, surprises you with a present? What do you do when that person surprises you with a present? You're excited? And what do you do? Do you do anything in return? I'm sorry? Yes. Such, such as what? Um, give them a present back. Okay, well, that's nice. How about if some, there's no present involved, if somebody um, does something especially nice for you, something you least expected it? I just know when somebody does something special, not especially nice for me, I always want to thank them. And thanks is part of, of giving and receiving. When someone gives you something, we do some nice things for them in return, such as a thank you card. Have you ever written a thank you card to grandma or somebody that's done something nice for you? Like what, what did you write a thank you card? You remember? Like write thank you cards for people for when, if they come to your birthday party? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I am a grandma, and I, I can tell you both that grandmas love thank you cards. So just remember that. And there's been times, too, that somebody's been really generous to me in one way or another, and I have baked them a cake. And isn't that a nice surprise, too? But the most important thing is like how you said you are thankful for Jesus because Jesus teaches us to give thanks to others. First of all, we will love one another. And when someone shows love to us, we in turn need to reciprocate and show that love back to them. If they have done something specially nice for us, something that just touched our heart, it wasn't a present, they just called you because you knew you were having a rough day, that touches your heart. So you don't maybe have to make a cake or send a card, but you make sure that you tell that person that you, that you appreciated it and you loved everything they did for you because that's what Jesus has done for us. So we have to live the life of Jesus and do as he has done for us. Okay? Can you remember that? Okay. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we are so thankful. We are so blessed with blessings beyond our imagination. But so often we fall short to thank you. Put that foremost in our minds that when someone shows us your love, that we will in return show them the love that we have for you. In your name we pray, amen. Let us pray and prepare to hear God's word. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading is Psalm 66, verses 1 through 12, and can be found on page 901 in your Pew Bible. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done, how awesome his works in man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. 
He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. Reading from the book that we love. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give thanks to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, let the words of this servant's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer, through Christ. Amen.
seated. Many times in our lives, we have experienced a contagious disease or a virus. Most of us as children came down with measles, mumps, and chickenpox. But fortunately today, for the most part, these diseases are eradicated by vaccinations. But we all continue to experience contagious colds, flus, and stomach viruses. Of course, lately, the most feared contagious virus has been COVID. And once testing positive, one went into quarantine and social distancing became a new phrase in our vocabulary. Thankfully, statistics now show that the larger population of positive cases recover quickly. But in Bible times, a common, very contagious, fearful disease was leprosy. Leprosy is found throughout the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments. Leprosy is a disease of the skin that worsens over time. It typically starts on the face, but will eventually involve all areas of the skin. Ulcers and sores continue to develop, gradually disfiguring people through loss of fingers, toes, and eventually limbs as the decayed skin spreads. It would spread internally, too, and often involve the vocal cords, resulting in hoarseness and difficulty breathing. And leopards smelled. They emitted an unpleasant odor due to this decaying skin. It was a very painful disease with no cure, and just like addiction, it could affect anyone in any town or economic class. Even kings weren't exempt. And in the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, commonly known as the book of the law, explicit instructions are given to one who suspects leprosy. First, during several weeks of quarantine, the patient was checked weekly by the priest. They weren't taken to the physician. The priests were like the health inspectors, or the CDC, and would determine whether it was a simple rash or indeed leprosy. Leprosy's effects were so severe that it had the potential to wipe out an entire population. So once diagnosed, the leopard would be thrown into isolation to live alone with other leopards until he died. They could never return to their family or to the rest of society again. We can't imagine. But they were indeed deemed as outcasts. My research said that their social distancing was approximately 16 feet. And when anyone came near, they had to cover their mouth and yell, I'm clean, I'm clean. The Jews saw it as a curse from God because leprosy was so visible and involved the decay of the body, it served as an excellent symbol of sinfulness. Sin corrupts someone spiritually in the way that leprosy corrupts someone physically. Being a leopard was the worst. Religiously, socially defiled in every way. No family, no job, no friends, no worship, no hope. They were the walking illustrations of sin. And in our scripture lesson today, Jesus met up with 10 leopards. It's no wonder that they cried out to him collectively. They knew that Jesus had the most powerful reputation of healing the sick. And they respectfully even called him master hoping that perhaps he would heal them as well. He was their only hope. He was their only chance. They had no way out of this dilemma. There were no cures or solutions. Their faith may have been limited, but they were desperate men, so they cried out to him. While obeying the law, Jesus instructed them to go to the priest. In good faith, they listened, and one by one, indeed, they were healed along the way before arriving to the priest. 
they were made clean, and the priests would indeed deem them as cured. And we know the rest of the story that only one healed leper returned and threw himself at the feet of Jesus, thanking and praising him for making him well. The other nine lepers went along their way, perhaps to the temple or headed straight home, not uttering one word of thanks for this miraculously healing. But this one most grateful man had a double whammy. He was not only once been a leopard, he was the forbidden Samaritan. He was a two-time outcast since the Samaritan race was despised and also avoided by the Jews. He was indeed the bottom of the barrel. Yes, he was way different from others, yet, but yet he was the only one who came back to thank Jesus. Then Jesus told him, your faith has made you well. And once again, we experience those pleasing to the word it, pleasing to the ear words of, your faith has made you well. Perhaps you remember those same words from Jesus' healing stories of the hemorrhaging woman and the blind man. He recognized this kind of faith in them as well. But what kind of faith is this? All of, this, all of us in the sanctuary today most freely can admit that we have faith, don't we? I surely think I do. But these last words of Jesus may definitely cause us all some confusion. What really happened that day on that border town of Galilee and Samaria? Well, we need to realize that the 10 desperate leopards actually had some kind of faith. When they obeyed Jesus to go to the priest, they may have shown a meager kind of faith in the power and the compassion of Jesus the healer. But knowing that God's grace is for everyone, not just a chosen race or culture, Jesus didn't even acknowledge their kind of faith, only the faith of the one who returned with gratitude. This kind of faith that the nine leopards had was shallow, very superficial. They wanted a healer, and that is what they got. And after they got what they needed, they didn't have any more interest in Jesus. No desire to worship him, no desire to glorify him, no desire to even thank him. They didn't see him as God or, or fall down or give to him that the one who would only give to God. This one Samaritan leopard, knew he had come face to face with God and his soul was traumatized. He was not only healed, he was well. He was transformed. He was new. He knew he was a sinner, but he knew that God had showed him mercy, compassion, and salvation. That is the big difference between these leopards and their faith. We see in this one man Trust, gratitude, thankfulness, love, praise, and worship. All components of faith that's way beyond the other nine. It's a faith that embraces Jesus as our God and as our Lord and Savior. It's a faith that bows humbly down in recognition of one's lowliness in his presence. It's the faith that Jesus not only says makes you well, but makes you whole and has saved you. These two entirely different outcomes resulting from the same scenario is what separates us from others as well. Are we like the nine with superficial faith who calls or even prays to Jesus when we need something from him and then moves on when our prayers are answered? Or are, we, are you the one who comes to church to get something out of it? Or are we like the one leper, knowingly is saved by Jesus and shows him love, praise, and gratitude for the Savior that he is and what he has done for everyone? If we are like him, we come to church to give thanks and praise to God. We aren't just takers, 
but were also givers of thanks and gratitude in return. Luke's account of the healing of the ten leopards grants us a glimpse of what gratitude can look like, what makes our faith well, and when we are saved by Christ and how we act out our faith to others. But living a life in gratitude to God, by living a life in gratitude to God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we strive to live holy and joyful lives. We demonstrate God's awesomeness by how we live and how we treat others. Gratitude is a practice, and we get better and better the more we exercise it. Grateful people take better care of themselves. They take better care of others. They take better care of the world. They see the glass half full and not half empty. They notice and they savor the good moments like a beautiful sunset where they stop their car just to look at the gorgeous autumn colors. They have positive emotions of joy and contentment. They even sleep better. They find the silver lining of goodness in any bad situations. They count their blessings. They say thank you often and show gratitude to others. They are blessed to be a blessing to others. They empower others because Jesus has empowered them. And gratitude may be simply pausing to notice and appreciate the things that we all take for granted and then humbly thanking God. It is being saved as we experience God's kingdom at hand in our everyday world by knowing the wholeness that Jesus gives. It is being amazed by what we receive from him, but the connection is not complete until we give our gratitude back to God. Writer Anne Lamont says she has two favorite prayers. In the morning, her prayer is, Help me, Jesus. Help me. Help me. And at bedtime, she prays, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. We see in this scripture that faith and gratitude are very closely related. Faith without gratitude is not faith at all. And there is something life-giving about gratitude. It is the faith that we have that we can stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow with a whole and full heart for Jesus. Then Jesus will answer and say, your faith has made you well. Amen. Let us stand together and profess the words of our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, in and through Jesus, you make known to your healing will and your desire to save. In Jesus, you give us new life, as fresh as the cr first crisp day of autumn in a new season, without fanfare and without fuss. You bring us wholeness as we journey on our way, asking nothing from us except that we remember and give you thanks and praise, and that we in return offer your good gifts to those around us who are in need. Like the healed Samaritan leopard, we thank you and we praise you. 
Lord, we pray for this church that we might do our best to present ourselves to God. We especially pray for our session whose leadership and decisions we have placed in their hands. We pray for our deacons in the outreach and care for others. We pray for our PNC who gives endless dedication as they work for the future of this church. We pray for our church staff who bring music to your ears and provide a clean place to worship you. Last but not least, we pray for our faithful members who shine your light in the darkened world. By serving together, we know that we can give you our very best. And Lord Jesus, as you healed the 10 lepers between Galilee and Samaria, we pray that you will heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those names presented in the joys of concerns list today. This morning, we lift up Reggie, Sharon, and Lloyd, Bill, Steve, Gary Gray, Bob, Jason Williams, Amanda, Mikey, Dina, and Malaya. We also add those names written on our hearts as we share aloud by lifting them to you. We pray for Along with all these prayers of people that need and in suffering, we pray for the many joys and blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We remember those who celebrate special days like birthdays this week. May they know your love and grace. And we pray for those who grieve losses of loved ones, present or in the past. May they be reminded and comforted by your promised gift of eternal life. And we continue to pray for Florida and all those in the time of devastation left from the hurricane. We pray for the help of rescue workers, utility workers, the Red Cross, Samaritan's Purse, the PDA, and all those who come to give aid to those afflicted in this catastrophic storm. Keep them safe. Give them strength and endurance to do their best to bring restoration to those in need. Remind all of the goodness that comes from you and your people who serve and help them. Hold them close and comfort them as they grieve their losses of property and lives. God, in your mighty power, you rule forever. Keep watch as we pray for our nation, our community, and all in authority. Lord Jesus, in your faithfulness to us, you shower us with grace, mercy, love, and all that we need. We pray that you will shape our hearts, that they will be filled with gratitude, that we might always return to you and give thanks. We pray all this in the words of Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Bring your gratitude, bring your blessings, bring your prayers, and bring your offerings. May our offerings be a living prayer for the welfare of God's kingdom.
practice your faith by practicing gratitude to God every day in all circumstances, for God is always making us new. And as you go out, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Alleluia. And all God's people of Union Presbyterian Church said, Amen. Amen.